All right. So our next speaker is Leslie Kelbing. Uh, she's a professor at MIT. Um, she's previously been at Brown University, uh, the AI Center of SRI and Teleos Research. And uh, she's done substantial research on designing situated agents, mobile robotics, reinforcement learning, and decision theoretic planning. Leslie, please. Cool, thank you. All right. Um, so good, so I had to come up with a title and I thought, okay, what in the world am I gonna actually talk about? And so I'm gonna talk about the value of knowing what you don't know and learning to sample and sampling to learn. And I thought I would look, so here I am at this workshop, which thank you for inviting me to speak at it, and I thought, okay, I better look and see what the workshop is about. So the workshop said, I am about using probabilistic inference techniques to improve reinforcement learning. So, okay. Um, I actually, in some sense, it depends on whether what you think reinforcement learning is, whether I do it or not, so we'll talk about that. I'll talk about what I do and how I use probabilistic inference techniques, in a sense, to help with that, and then we can see what we think about that. So here's my motivating example. My motivating example is this kitchen. I show it in every talk I give. It is not my kitchen, but it is a kind of a mess, and it is the domain that motivates me when I think about what problem I want to solve. I want to be able to make a robot that could roll into that kitchen or your kitchen or any kitchen anywhere and figure out what to do. Make dinner or clean it up or whatever it is that you asked it to do in that kitchen. And so this is a really hard problem and it's hard for a bunch of reasons, all of which are interesting. So one is that it's very high, so it's complicated. Everyone says I work in complex domains and what complex means to you is not what complex means to me, so that's okay. What, what, one of the things that's complicated about this domain is the dimensionality, right? So uh, robotics people like to talk about how many degrees of freedom their robot has, but how many degrees of freedom does this kitchen have? Right? How many objects do there, are there? They have six degrees of freedom. Uh, is the stuff in the blue bowl rotten? How many grapes are there? When are the people coming home? All these things, the degrees of freedom you can't even count. The horizon is long. If you think of how many primitive steps it would take to clean this kitchen, that's a lot. You don't want to think about that, but it would be a lot. And the uncertainty is really, really fundamental. Um, we already heard Amo said, oh, if you have uncertainty, too much uncertainty, you should just buy more sensors. So that's like a favorite line of robotics people. You worry about uncertainty, buy more sensors. Okay, <clears throat> so I need a sensor for like what's in the lower left cupboard or how rotten the food is or when the people are coming home. I don't have a sensor for what's in your head. I don't, there's lots of things I don't have a sensor for and I will not have a sensor for directly. Okay, so it's a complicated problem. That's what I like to think about. Um, in a sense, we take a pretty old school approach to this problem. We think about uh, a state estimator, which is gonna aggregate observations and actions that the system has taken over time, something that's gonna make plans and take actions, and so it's a, it's a kind of model predictive control approach that we take. But really, if you draw a certain kind of box and defocus your eyes and forget what's inside the box, well, it's reinforcement learning, right? Because we take in observations and rewards and we give out actions, and there's stuff inside there which adapts somehow to the information it's getting and is supposed to behave in a way that, that you know, learns to be better over time. So if you think that that's reinforcement learning, then we're doing reinforcement learning and we can have the rest of this conversation. And if not, well, I don't know. Okay, so that's, that's our setup. So what are the roles, at least in our approach right now, for probabilistic inference in this architecture? So the easiest one to think about is state estimation, right? So here's my robot, it's trying to figure out how to clean up the kitchen or put stuff away or make dinner, and it has some fundamental uncertainty about the state of the world. So we all kind of understand the idea of state estimation. It's gonna aggregate sensor observations and get better estimates of the positions of things and so on. That is, of all the probabilistic inference problems in this world, the, it's not easy, and it's certainly not just a common filter and all that, but that one we kind of have a reasonably good handle on, I would argue. So I'm not gonna really talk about that too much. There's learning the model, though. Okay, I just said we weren't gonna worry too much about state estimation, but of course, from my perspective, I think that model learning, in some sense, is just another kind of state estimation, although we're gonna treat it separately here, right? So there's. What if I don't know the transition and observation models for my domain? Then that's a kind of model learning. And I'm actually gonna spend most of this time talking about that. Another thing which I've spent a ton of time personally thinking about is planning and action selection under uncertainty. 
Um, again, that is now I think the piece of this problem that we have the best handle on. So we do a kind of model predictive control in belief space. Uh, I could tell you about that at length another time. It works pretty nicely. That is not my worst problem. So right now, what's really driving us is, is thinking about how do we learn models of the world? And in particular, how do we learn them at a level of abstraction that's useful for the planet? Right, because you could say, oh, I could learn, I can learn models, different systems of differential equations. I could learn all different kinds of models. We have a particular planning strategy that works well in the kinds of problems that we're thinking about. And the question is, well, how can we learn models for that kind of a plan? So that's what I'm going to try to think about. Okay, so now the question is, well, what is I, the sort of the state of the art right now for planning in large hybrid domains? And by large, I mean really high dimensional, like lots of objects. Um, and the problem is that pure forward search generally doesn't work very well. Uh, we have usually reasonably long horizons and infinite branching factors. Uh, and so A star and infinite branching doesn't work too well. You have to sample if you have infinite action selections. And the way you do the sampling is really critical to success. Um, not just a matter of slow or not slow, but a matter of works or, or doesn't work. Um, so most of the current, there's been really a spate of work in, in this particular kind of hybrid planning. A lot of it goes under the name TAMP for ta task and motion planning. Right, task planning is the discrete structure of which object should I pick up or what should I put in the oven or what, you know, at the high level, what should I do? And then the motion planning is about the, uh, the, the more continuous parts. People are used to thinking about robot motion planning as maybe RRTs or something like that. But another really critical thing is something that stands between the highest level stuff, like what ingredients do I need for cooking dinner, and the lowest level stuff, like how do I move, and that involves a lot of continuous choices of parameters, like how should I choose to grasp this object? Or if I'm moving it out of the way, where should I put it, right? So these are continuous variables that have to be chosen. They have to be chosen well. Uh, and they serve almost as an interface between the highest level considerations and the lowest ones. Um, so Mark Toussaint's work, stuff that we do with, and some of the students in our lab, these are, they're all strategies for planning that mix either sampling or optimization for dealing with the continuous parts of the problem and some kind of logical or discrete planning for dealing with the discrete parts of the problem. And they all come down in the end to representing in some form constraints among the continuous choices or sometimes among the continuous and discrete choices. And so although we have different strategies for solving the problem, we all have not that different of a representation of the underlying sort of dynamics of the planning problem that we need in order to solve it. So we're gonna think about this, uh, this idea of trying to formalize the operations that the robot can do in the world uh, in terms of representation of kind of constraints over the continuous values that are involved in an operation. Okay, so how can we learn a new operation? Imagine the robot uh, wants to stir stuff in a bowl. That's an operation that it could, it could learn and we would like to be able to add it to its repertoire. So the first step is just learning the basic kind of control program, a policy or something. You might learn it using policy search or something. I am not going to talk about that. Other people are doing it and they're doing a great job and that's good. So I'm imagining that people who are learning policies, reorienting objects, pouring, stirring, walking, those are awesome. We're going to think about how could I take all those nice low level primitives and put them together so that the robot could actually accomplish high level goals in the world. So that's what we're thinking about. So assume somebody learned the primitive. In order for us to come up with a nice model that the planner can use, we have to figure out which other objects in the world are relevant to the predictions I wanna make about what happens when I operate on this object. That's something I talked about yesterday. Um, and then we need to learn a kind of detailed relationship among these objects, the constraint among properties of these objects that will make uh, the operation work out. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today. We also need to be able to, once we've learned this thing, use it in planning, and I'll talk about that also. Okay, so how can a competent robot acquire a new ability? That's our question. 
Uh, so we already have a primitive skill, and we want to learn how to integrate it into, let's say, a system that's already able to do some stuff. For instance, if I taught you to cut cucumbers or whip an egg, uh, you might not know how to do that, and then after I taught you, you would. But you could then immediately use everything you already knew about manipulating objects in service of doing that thing. And so we want to be able to do that, to add something new to a repertoire. So I'm going to show you a couple of simple examples. The first one we started working on was just trying to predict, imagine that I could push an object. Um, that's my basic primitive. When can I use it to achieve an objective, right? So I have a skill called push. Maybe it takes some parameters, like which hand to use and how far. Uh, I'm interested, let's say, in using it to achieve some objective, like that object is in some region of space. Um, and I'm assuming if the skill is some kind of a black box, I can execute it. I can tell whether it succeeded, but I don't want to simulate it in detail while I am planning. I just want to know, under what conditions is it likely to work out okay? So that I can use that as a model at a high level of abstraction. Okay, so, uh, so what we're interested in coming up with is an operator description that looks like something that came out of an ancient AI planning textbook, except that a bunch of these parameters are continuous. Right, so uh, I want to say, under what circumstances is it the case that if I execute this primitive skill, some goal will be achieved? So uh, in this case, uh, and I've in, in, in this work that I'm going to talk about here in this workshop, I'm assuming that we already know which objects and which properties of those objects are relevant to this prediction. Figuring out this little skeleton of an operation is itself a problem, but it's not the one that I'm going to talk about here. So imagine I know that the current pose of the object, the pose of the hand, the location of the region in space, those things all matter. And I want to learn a constraint or a relation on all of those continuous parameters such that if they, those parameters stand in that relation, then it's very likely that if I execute this primitive procedure, my desired result will happen. So, so that's what I want to learn. Um, so attempt number one, I'm just gonna, I, this is kind of entertaining. Attempt number one was me and Tomas. So one summer we said, okay, we're gonna do this. So we, and we heard that neural networks were cool, so we're gonna use neural networks. So we, we said, all right, I'm gonna learn to map all these parameters, all those continuous parameters into basically, I'm gonna use a classifier to predict the probability that if I were to do that particular operation in that particular way, the likelihood that it would come out right. So we generated a bunch of training data, trained this classifier that seemed to work pretty well. Okay, good, so now we wanna use it for planning. So to use it for planning, we're in the situation where we have a result. We typically do backward planning, means ends planning, we have an objective, and we wanna know where would I need to put my hand and what parameters should I give to the procedure so that I could push this object into the goal? Okay, that seems like a reasonable thing you could ask and you could say, all right, I'm gonna take my neural network, I'm gonna bind, fix some of the parameters and then maximize over the other ones so that I can get a good suggestion of like where I should put my hand in order to put the push the object into the region. Um, it turned out that that was a real problem. So this neural network that we trained up had no understanding of what it knew or didn't know. And we inadvertently uh, found a really good strategy for generating adversarial examples for our own model, right? We said, oh, which way of pushing this is gonna work the best? And then our org would say, oh, that thing over there, you haven't tried it, but I think it's gonna be awesome. And of course, it would always be awful. Okay, so uh, we were able to learn something. I'm not gonna really go over the details. With a lot of training examples, we were able to learn good strategies for pushing objects into regions. That is to say, learn a good model for when this low-level primitive would have the desired effect. Okay, so, but it needed too much data. It wasn't too satisfactory, but it served a good purpose, which was to enrage some of our students so that they did a better job. So now that's really what I wanna talk about. Okay, so attempt number two by students. Um, uh, they also just started with a motivating example that was more complicated, because that's how that goes. So now we've learned a simple primitive for our robot, which is pouring stuff from one vessel into another. I should have brought some cups to demonstrate, but that's okay. Same basic story, I have this pouring skill, it has a parameter, which is the gain. I would like liquid to get from one cup into the other one. And again, a human at least figured out the structure of this operation. It said, well, I think that this is gonna depend on how I'm holding the cup I'm pouring from, the shape of the cup I'm pouring from, the shape of the cup I'm pouring into, and their relative pose. 
that's a bunch of continuous parameters. And if I could learn, again, the constraint, the relationship among those continuous parameters, such that if those parameters all stand in the right relation to one another, the pouring will be successful, then I have a really useful model of this operation that I can use in my high-level planning. So now that's our objective. Okay, so we're gonna do the two things I kind of advertised a little bit in the, in the title. So we're going to do active learning. We would like to learn this constraint by sampling just a few uh, training examples because we want to do this on the actual robot and training examples are expensive. So we're going to use sampling to learn effectively. And then uh, we're also going to actually later on learn to draw samples during planning. So there's, there's two sides to this. Okay, so how do we do this? This time we're gonna, instead of neural network, we're gonna use a Gaussian process. Uh, we're gonna say that, that, that there's a score. So for every pore, instead of thinking about it either works or doesn't, we have some score function G, and we'd like to learn when does that score function above zero. Those are gonna be the cases where we think pouring was good enough. So we can think of it as a regression problem. We take in a vector of those parameters that describe the situation in which we're doing the pouring, and out comes the score. And we put into that a bunch of training examples, there we go, um, of pouring and how successful it was. Okay, so that's GP regression. That seems like not too difficult of a problem. But now we wanna use some active strategy for querying so that we don't have to use too many samples. One of the things that's interesting and different about this setup, um, okay, so probably everyone in this room understands about Gaussian processes. The thing that's slightly different here is that we're not interested in finding the optimum. And I, I'll say more about that later on. But we're interested in characterizing the super level set. That is to say, we would like to find the regions of the input space where the function is above zero. Not just one point, not just the best point, but really like all the good ways, all the good ways of pouring. Because if you ask me to pour, I'm, I might have a way that I kind of like but I could do it this way, I could do it with my other hand, I could do it like this. So I have actually a fair amount of flexibility and so I would like to learn really the locus of, of good pores in a sense. So there's a nice algorithm, hmm. I don't know, my little citation didn't appear. Oh, there we go. Okay, there, uh, there's a nice algorithm called the straddle algorithm which which actually gives you an acquisition function for uh, optimizing this function that focuses on, uh, on trying to locate the level set. So it focuses in this picture here, the black region right now is the only region of the input space where I believe with high probability that the function is above zero. So that's the super level set. And what I wanna do is find more black region. I wanna expose places where I'm really pretty sure that this thing is gonna be good. And so the acquisition function ends up sampling near the boundaries of where you think the thing might be good, and it focuses on, on sort of elucidating more and more of that black region. Okay, so if we do this uh, in, a, this is in a simulated boring setup. Uh, okay, if we randomly gather data, we don't learn very well. Um, if we use Tomas's and my method, it's better than random, which is gratifying, but not all that good. Um, something uh, in between, the orange don't worry about it, and this, the red curve here is uh, using that acquisition function from the straddle algorithm and the GP regression, right? So in not too many examples, we learn reasonably quickly um, how, to, how to do this pouring reliably. Again, we're not learning how to pour, we're learning the conditions under which this primitive policy that we have will work pretty well. A similar thing happens in this case for scooping sugar out of the sugar bowl. So again, the red here is the GP regression and that's, that's much quicker. Okay, so just with that, so what do we do? We know we took in this case uh, a pouring operation and a pushing operation. We added them to this robot which already has a sort of semi good ability to pick things up and put them down. So it looks at the objects, we put the objects at the table in different ways and we get for different goals and my PowerPoint is being really weird. Okay. Oh man, I have to play my robot. There we go. Um, so right, so it's doing pretty general purpose task and motion planning here though. It's reasoning about geometry, it understands that it has to move stuff out of the way. 
Uh, it is executing paths generated by an RRT. It understands that when the cup is full, it needs to observe the constraint that it stays upward, but that later when it's putting it down, it can tip it over if it wants to. There it moved the green thing out of the way so that it pick up the blue cup. Um, so this is pretty highly variable. The set of arrangements of stuff that it can deal with, the set of goals it can deal with is pretty highly variable. I think it would be difficult to learn a policy, straight up policy to do this, surely possible of course, but doing the model predictive control thing is, is actually, I think, works pretty well. Here, the bowl was too far away. It couldn't reach over to pour there. So it, it figured out that it should scoot the bowl over and then pick something up over here and, and put it here. So again, it's, oh, it almost dropped that cuff off the table. Again, it moves the bowl, uh, picks up the cup, and uh, yeah. Okay, so there's more of this. Um, okay, so good. So that was, using not too many samples to learn the pre-image, in some sense, to learn an abstract model of when my low-level procedure would work well. So that was one part of the problem. The next part of the problem is planning. So during planning, I have operations that have continuous parameters and I have to be able to use them efficiently. Why did I have lost track of what my time was? Okay. Um, I would like five minutes-ish. Oh, there we go. Ten minutes ish. Okay, good. All right, so learning to sample. So now let's assume that I know these operations. I know the constraints. I know the sets of regions that are going to work. So now there's two ways to think about this problem. Sort of there's a, an easier case and a harder case. We'll start with the easier case because it's the one we've been working on anyway. So imagine that I've done my GP regression and I understand this super level set. So I have a kind of a a, a kind of an implicit representation of the locus of places where pouring will probably work. And now the planner says, okay, I would like to pour from here into here. So now this is a contextual problem in the sense that I've got some of these parameters fixed, but I would like to know values of the other parameters that will make it work out. But what I want to do is be able to generate a diverse set of samples from that black region. Because for instance, the first one I might as well generate the one that I think is going to work the best. Like why not? Uh, but the planner might decide, the planner might say, uh, actually, can you tell me a different way to do the pouring, right? Like it might be that something's in the way. So I can't, my favorite way of pouring is like this, but this thing is in the way, so I need to do it differently. So uh, we have a, a, a kind of way of sampling a diverse set of samples from the space um, so, that, so that we can, so that the planner can uh, try a variety of different strategies so that it can eventually find a good way of solving the problem. So that's, that's one, one important kind of, of strategy. In this case, uh, it's a reasonably low dimensional problem and we have an almost explicit representation of that set. There are some other cases though that are important than that we've been exploring. Um, so an, another setup is one where um, if, you, if you think about it, you might imagine that you could just learn a policy. So in this case, the robot is having to predict how should it grasp an object. It's a similar kind of problem because, uh, or, or where should it put something down to put it out of the way? It's a similar kind of problem, um, but if it has to involve motion planning too, it's hard to do the, the whole planning problem all at once. So you might say, oh, planning is very expensive. It costs a lot. I don't want to do that. This is a learning crowd. I'll just learn a policy to do this. But then there's a lot of variability. It's hard to learn the whole policy. It's hard to represent the scene, the arrangement of objects in the world. So learning this whole thing doesn't work very well either. And what we found is that actually it can sometimes be really useful to do something partway in between. So again, the idea is that, that planning, there's certain kinds of planning problems that are pretty easy to solve. And actually ba basic robot motion planning is not that hard anymore. So we can say, all right, we'd let the motion planner plan if we just nail down some aspects of the solution for it. If we pick the grasps and the placements by learning, then maybe the planner can do predictions. And so we, we're kind of operating in a way that, that does some amount of learning mixed with some amount of planning. Uh, and so now here's this robot. It's trying to figure out how to move objects from one place to another in a complicated scene. So it has to pick things like grasps and placements. And the way we think about this um, is actually to, to the, the hardest part about the scene here is, is actually encoding the arrangement of objects. 
Enumerating the objects with their poses is not a nice representation. Some kind of voxels is also not nice. Uh, the robot can't see the whole thing, so images are not really what we need. It's very hard to think about a representation. So one idea is to actually represent the state of the world in terms of things the robot can do. Right? So the robot might try to reach for this object in a certain way or reach for that object in another way. You could imagine a whole set of things that the object could try to do, possible solutions, and learn the way in which they're correlated with one another. So that if the robot tries one thing and it doesn't work, that gives it information about which other things might work. So when I say try, I mean try in its head. It's not, none of this is happening in the world. So we're gonna now represent scenes in terms of the effectiveness of different things that the robot might actually try to do. And that ended up being this algorithm called Box, uh, which uh, my student Bam Joon Kim uh, published a while ago. Uh, so it starts with a set of, of, of particular constraints and it learns of the correlations among these constraints offline. And then what it means is that online, it tries the thing it thinks is gonna work the best and if it doesn't, it uses the fact that that thing didn't work to update its belief about the other things and how well they're likely to work. And so that gives it an adaptive sampling mechanism. And that works pretty well, works better than a bunch of other adaptive sampling mechanisms. And then this year in the main conference, uh, another student of mine, Zi Wang and Bam Joon had a paper that actually proved some regret balance on sampling using this and also in some continuous cases. As the space gets even bigger and you really have big spaces of choices, uh, another approach um, that Bam Joon has also pursued is to basically use a GAN, so train a GAN to generate samples. So here we have, again, the robot's done some planning and sometimes it's found plans that work and plans that don't work and it imagines that the things it tried, the samples that it made on the plans that worked, those were good choices, potentially, and the samples on plans that didn't work or that were not yet found whether they worked or not can be used as a kind of a negative example. Um, and so he did an importance weighting strategy to train up a GAN to generate these samples. And what's interesting, so learning to sample wisely in a planner makes the planner faster. So people have known this for years and years, but mostly people haven't tried it in continuous spaces. So we trained up a GAN to generate placements for these objects in this world. And we found that in this case, the robot had to place two objects. And so what it learns, what the, the GAN learns is to propose placements of the first object that are kind of out of the way. So that if I have to put more objects into this cupboard, they'll fit, right? But it's not doing that reasoning anymore. It's kind of backed that reasoning up in a sense. And now it just can generate reasonably good choices for an initial placement. Uh, because of the experience that it's had before. And this also then, because it's generating reasonable replacements, it speeds up the planning. Okay, so good. So, uh, so I just kind of to recap here, the talk was about learning to do model predictive control in high dimensional spaces. Um, as in almost every application of learned models to the world, it's really important to know what you don't know. Uh, that kept us sampling action choices inside the region of things that we actually had data to support whether they were good or not. Um, it's important also to actually be deliberate in your information gathering so everyone kind of understands that, but uh, yet again, actively reasoning about what information you need can reduce the wear and tear on your robot a lot. And uh, at least for us, it was important to be able to learn models that actually support the particular planning methods we're gonna use later, and that was a combination of kind of logical and continuous representations, and the ability to do sampling from the continuous representations that helps our particular kinds of planning strategies. So uh, with that, I will say thank you and take questions, and you can watch the robot mess up slightly while you ask, so thanks. Any questions? Thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. So actually, I'm working on constraint learning right now. And then I find it is really interesting because um, constraints are basically sets for the, mm -hmm. rather than you know, the point-based optimization. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more like robust and transfer, transferred 
can be transferred to another task. And also, you know, you can think of like logics, you know, Boolean compositions for constraints or something like that. But I think the issue is that, you know, in general, the agent have like dynamics or inertia. So I mean, if you think of like intersection of constraints, maybe it might not be like feasible. Um, you know, even if each constraint is feasible, if you like think of intersection, maybe it might not be feasible. So we have to think of, you know, in which, um, or you know, you know, maybe, you know, for example, you know, if there is like the ball trying to crash into the like wall, then maybe, you know, if it's too close to the wall, maybe it's too late to, to, to take actions to mm. avoid collision or something, something like that. So what I want to ask is, you know, how are you taking, that, taking into account this kind of um, feasibility? Problem? Yeah, okay, good. So um, I should say that we are only addressing a kind of a small piece of the whole problem, right? And so our assumption in all our planning at the, the level at which we do the planning is that things are quasi-static. And that of course there are dynamics in the world, but those are kind of managed by control policies. So I'm assuming that stirring and walking and throwing and all those things for me are kind of macros or options or something. And I am now mostly focused on how do I put those together to do something else. So I am not worried about some of the stability kinds of things and so on. Uh, so, the, I mean, it's, it's great to have the separation between low level stuff and, and low, uh, disc discrete variables, but I think there are multiple choices for discrete variables. So, so you're picking like primitives of policies and you decide over them. If you look at what uh, Mark Chusano is doing, he's kind of picking sub goals which become cost functions for some low level thing. Yeah. And then his low, low level thing effectively can discover new maybe manipulation stuff or whatever. I, right. I guess yours is more efficient. So how would you yeah, compare good. those? So, so no, that's great. So and, and in fact, I have this argument with Josh Tenenbaum all the time, and he cites you as evidence against. Um, and and in fact, I think it does. Okay. So so let me let me let's enter the modularity uh, game a little bit, right? So if I have a module that can do something, walk, stir, throw, whatever, I actually don't really care whether it's a learned policy or whether it's model predictive control using some beautiful low-level physics simulator or the solution to a constraint problem. I don't know if Mark is still here, but what we understand is that his method and our methods have complementary strengths. Uh, his method is great when there aren't too many objects involved but it begins to fall down when there are lots of choices about what to move and when and why and so on, right? So he manages the constraints much better than we do when it's in the small, and, and we manage the big combinatorial stuff better, I think. So I would not mind at all backing off the idea that what I think of as a primitive right now, I think of them as, as say, learned policies, but I would be totally happy, actually, if what I think of as a primitive is actually a call to somebody's optimization engine. That would be totally fine. From the, my perspective, it's fine. But I still need to know, it's still helpful to know, at some level of abstraction, how big of a problem your optimizer can bite off and chew, right? And that's, in fact, what your last question, someone asked you this question, you know, how, what, how long of a horizon and how big of a problem. So there's a size of problem that you can solve and a size of problem you can't, and I need to understand what, what that is. Other questions? In that case, let's uh, thank Leslie again.